Good morning. My pleasure to be here with you this morning and grateful for everyone who is in attendance with us. Thank you, Mike, for that prayer and Robert for those good songs, for everyone joining in heartily. Uh, there was an announcement made this morning about the uh, Good Samaritan project that will take place. Mary uh, asked me to remind everyone that uh, if you would like to participate in that by uh, donating funds toward that. She is still receptive of donations and needful of them, and that is a, certainly a good work that benefits uh, many, especially our young people that are involved in it. So if you'd like to help out with that, it would be greatly appreciated. This morning, as you see, as you're about to see, uh, we are talking about something that I can see, but y'all can't. Um, we are talking this morning about the subject of choosing joy, choosing joy. Got the thumbs up. So you uh, see the subject there and I guess the thesis or the premise of this lesson this morning is that obviously to a degree joy is a choice. So we're going to define what we're talking about with regard to joy and we're going to operate under the assumption that in our lives Joy is a choice, and overall, we're talking about kind of the direction of our life. We know that we're not joyful all the time. Difficult things happen that take our joy away. Uh, good things happen that give us great joy, and sometimes it can be a, a temporary emotion. But this morning, let us think that as far as a permanent direction, uh, governing force, if you will, in our lives, uh, are we... A joyful people and I would say that tell you the 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 end at the beginning is that that joy jo true joy in life can only come through Jesus Christ and a knowledge of him and a belief in him and that of course uh, changes everything so we're going to talk about that choice I'm going to give you uh, kind of a protracted illustration of it and then we're going to apply that to the Christian and then we're going to look at some biblical examples uh, time permitting toward the end of the lesson. So choosing joy this morning, and I believe that we can choose joy. The man that you see here in the picture is Matthew McKenzie Mack, as he is known, Robinson. Mack was born in Cairo, Georgia. People from the south of Georgia call that Cairo in 1914. Mac and his family were left fatherless early in childhood, and his mother made the decision to move he and his siblings all the way from South Georgia to Pasadena, California. While there and in middle school, Mac was diagnosed with a heart murmur, and because of that, he was encouraged in that day and time, wanted to play sports, but was encouraged to play only non-contact sports. So that led Mac to make the decision to be involved in track and field. Eventually, because of the uh, prowess that he showed in that, he was able to go to the junior college in Pasadena, California, right there in his hometown, where he had much success setting junior college records in the 100, the 200 meter dashes, and the long jump. What you see him holding here is an Olympic silver medal, a silver medal. After making the U.S. Olympic team, Matt competed in the Summer Olympics, and if you do the math, and he was born in 1914, he was about the age to participate in the Olympics in 1936. The Olympics in 1936, as many of you, if you are familiar with American uh, world and Olympic history, you know that those took place in Berlin, Germany. Well, Matt competed in the Olympics in the 200 meter sprint, and in that race, Mac McKenzie Robinson beat the previous Olympic record by a full tenth of a second, which is an eternity in a 200 meter race. He beat the previous Olympic record by a tenth of a second. The reason, however, that you see him posing with a silver medal 
is because if you know about the Berlin Germany Olympics in 1936, you know that someone other than Mac Robinson dominated the track and field. His name was Jesse Owens, Mac's teammate. Owens came in first and was the superstar of those games, winning four gold medals, which was unheard of at the time. Jesse Owens became the darling of the Olympics, not only on the American stage, but in some circles, the world stage, uh, because of Hitler's position against the uh, participation of African Americans in the Olympics. Didn't like it, didn't want it, but Jesse Owens came there and dominated the games. So, in front of Mac Robinson, who beat the former Olympic record, you have Jesse Owens finishing first. The man who came in third in those games was from the Netherlands. His name was Martinus Osendarp. And he became the national hero of his country for being, as many writers have put it, the fastest white man in the games at that time. In fact, the president of KLM Airlines sent a plane to fly Osendarp home. Mac Robinson, one writer said, simply boarded uh, packed his medal, his silver medal, and his Team USA gear and boarded the ship for the 10-day trip back to a country where he couldn't legally drink from the same water fountain as his teammates. But you might say, but he won a silver medal in the Olympics. His accomplishment was not recognized in his hometown. He was not lauded by his countrymen. Uh, he just packed up and went home. Mac Robinson could have chosen to be bitter, bitter at the lack of recognition, bitter at the racism that existed uh, at the time, but instead he chose to continue his education and his track and field career. He ended up at the University of Oregon where he continued to compete and win and set NCAA records. More importantly, if you think uh, Oregon is a long way from Pasadena on the same coast, but he stayed engaged with his family back home. He sent money. He encouraged his family, particularly his younger brother who followed in his footsteps, as you can imagine, being proud of your older brother and went to Pasadena Junior College. Well, this younger brother, Mac, almost talked him into coming and joining him at the University of Oregon but it so happened that his younger brother caught the eye of the athletic department at, the, at UCLA, where he lettered in four sports, one of them being baseball. Mac Robinson's younger brother is known to us as Jackie Robinson, the man that shattered the color bar barrier in the major leagues. And I like to think that Jackie's success was helped along by the encouragement of his older brother, Mac. Now, seeing all the athletes around him achieve superstardom could have had a negative effect on Robinson. But when he got out of college, he wasn't bitter. He went back home, and he chose to live a life that was not defined by coming in second. He worked hard and stayed involved in the Pasadena community. He lobbied for better parks and playgrounds. He advocated for better books in the libraries and did anything that he could do that would encourage and educate the youth of his town and keep them out of drugs and gangs. All while not having any recognition for his own accomplishments and while working as a janitor for the city of Pasadena. Thankfully, eventually, things changed in Pasadena, California and in the United States. And in 1984, Mac People went back and recognized his accomplishments. He was chosen to carry the Olympic flag in the opening ceremony of the Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. He was entered into the Oregon uh, Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, and there were other honors as well, including a local post office that was named in his honor. Mac Robinson chose joy over bitterness. This morning, I say that as Christians, we can do the same thing. Regardless of our circumstance, we can decide to be joyful. And again, that relies on our reliance on Jesus Christ. But before we move into kind of the biblical 
picture of joy, let's look at some synonyms. If you had to think in your head real quick, what would I say is a synonym? What is another word that speaks to me and says joy? Uh, and if you think of those, I think you would probably uh, have a list that was very similar to mine. Amusement, again, temporary, bliss, happiness, cheer, delight, pride, wonder, and then one that kind of speaks to a more permanence is satisfaction. Are we satisfied in our lives and are we joyful in the process? And then we could look at the antonyms of joy. What are some of these things that are opposite? And here's the list that I wrote down, beginning with, and I'll highlight depression because I kind of a, if I could step aside with a disclaimer to this lesson, a couple of things. Number one, there are times in our life when difficulties take place. You may have the, the death of a loved one, a sickness. There are a litany of things that can happen to us and steal our joy. And those are difficult. But again, I think in God's eyes, we need to recognize that those should be temporary. We, we need to find a way to move past them. But we, we may not be joyful in those times. And the second, more importantly maybe, is the fact that there are things that I'm not qualified to really understand or teach about when people have difficulty and really deal with clinical level anxiety or depression. And that's when things are physiologically going on in the body that will steal your joy. And in those cases, I don't want to be somebody that says, you know what, you, you, you don't, you're happy, you're not happy, you're sad, you're depressed. Well, get over it. Sometimes it's really tough to get over. But generally speaking, if we think again in the, in the framework of the direction of our lives, are we people who are seeking after and choosing to have joy? But here are some opposites of that. Sadness, melancholy, misery, again, bitterness, sorrow, woe, and sometimes mourning. These are things that kind of help us get a framework of what we want to talk about this morning. Moving along to a biblical understanding of this word, the biblical word for joy occurs 179 times in the, in the English Standard Version of the Bible in 171 different verses. Uh, the Hebrew and the Greek are given here. And any time that joy is talked about, it is, it is not any time, but almost every time joy is talked about, it is the, one of these words or a derivative thereof. The Hebrew word is simcha. And there's a neat thing now on the Internet when you can actually click on and see how a word is supposed to be pronounced. And so now I know how to pronounce uh, one Hebrew word, simcha. The Greek word is chara which I found very interesting that the word chara in the Greek uh, is what is translated into the word joy in our language because that sounds very joyful, doesn't it? Hara. Um, those are the biblical derivatives of this word. And again, this can be an emotional reaction, a temporary thing. We have biblical examples of that in the book of Esther. If you know that great story, uh, the, the Jewish people in this kingdom uh, are going to be obliterated. There's been a law passed that's going to make it okay. And their enemies have sought to destroy them. Well, because of Esther's courage, choosing uh, the joy of courage, that is you know, turned around and there is rejoicing. And Esther... Chapter 8, verse 17, it says, In every province and every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, this was the second command that saved the Jews, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. We recognize these as joyful times. Another example, in Matthew 2, verse 10, we know that the wise men were seeking after the, the Messiah, the king of the Jews that had been born. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and that was certainly a joyful occasion. So we understand that that can be an emotional, somewhat temporary reaction. And more what we're going for this morning is this idea 
of a spiritual joy, a frame of mind, and a way of life. And this is very closely tied to our Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, Noah did a great job reading from John chapter 15. If you would like to turn with me there, verses 1 through 11, we learn about what we need to be connected to to have the kind of joy that we're talking about this morning. Jesus himself says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Joy is spoken of as one of the fruits of the Spirit. Joy is spoken of in this passage. And Jesus here tells us that you can't bear fruit unless you're connected to me. And there are some qualifications to that. Some things that we need to do to be connected to Jesus. Verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out. As a branch is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you, and abide in my love. Qualification. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, key verse here, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So Jesus is telling us here that we have to be connected to him for many reasons, one of which is to enjoy the joy of life that we're talking about. He tells us that to do that, we have to understand and follow the commandments that he gives. They are written down for us in his word. Verse 11 again, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus is concerned with our joy. In fact, if you turn a couple of pages over in your Bible to chapter 17 of John, here we have what we could more accurately refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Jesus' prayer near the end of his life, near the end of his time on earth, and the prayer that he prays. In this prayer, Jesus prays first for himself, second, he prays for those who were the closest followers of his, that he's going to leave behind to do his work. And thirdly, he prays for all believers. By default, that would include all of us. And in that prayer, uh, a key verse, verse 13, Jesus says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus prays in the first part of this prayer that uh, God will glorify him. That God will be glorified as he is glorified. Jesus is in essence praying. He knows that the time has come for the the culmination of his mission on this earth to, to be fulfilled. He knows that that includes dying on the cross, uh, being separated from his father for a time, taking on the sin of the world, and then being raised to walk again and ascending into heaven where he will reclaim uh, his former glory. He knows that he's praying that that will take place. And then he prays in the second part of the prayer for, again, those who would be left behind. He says, I pray for them, verse 9, I do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours and all are mine, uh, all, and all mine are yours and yours are mine. I am glorified in them. He left behind 
these folks that wanted, he wanted to take part in his glorification, his joy. When Jesus talks about his joy, we're part of that. If we don't recognize and follow his commandments and stay connected to that vine, his joy isn't as full as it would be because he wants that for each of us. More importantly, our joy will not be as full as it could be. But in verse 13, he says, I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus wanted the followers that he left behind to have this joy and he, wanted, he wants us to have it. Now, we know that many of the apostles were martyred. They, they had this joy in life because they obeyed the commandments of God and they followed them and they did great work, which is evidenced by the fact that we're here today. But they did that with a joy of knowing that they were following Jesus and connected to the vine. They did that with a joy of knowing the things that we sang about this morning when we talked about the happy summer land of bliss, no tears in heaven. That was their aim, that was their purpose, and that was their function in life, was to live a life choosing that kind of joy. In the time that we have left this morning, let's talk about a few characters who, under difficult circumstances, still chose joy in their lives. Number one, uh, the character of Jacob. And in Genesis chapter 29, if you read the preceding chapter, you see that Jacob's father Isaac has sent him away to Paden Aram and basically to find a wife. And things were a little different in those days, so uh, he sends him to a family member uh, to find a wife. And when Jacob gets there, you read the story, it's very poignant and, uh, you know, it's frankly uh, kind of romantic. He sees Rachel and he goes and helps her and waters the flock, asks about her, and then goes to talk to her father, Laban. And Laban receives Jacob uh, joyfully and enthusiastically. And uh, I can just imagine him being excited about his daughter uh, and, and this, this fine young man having an interest in his daughter. I can relate. Uh, so the, the problem is that Laban makes a deal with Jacob and says, okay, yeah, you can marry Rachel, but first you've got to work seven years. Got to work seven years. Genesis 29 verse 18 says, Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve seven years for Rachel. And the Bible says that they seemed like only a few days to him because of how much he loved her. And that's, that's a, a, a very sweet story. However, uh, because of the trickery of Laban, uh, Jacob woke up married to Leah. And then he had to work another seven years. Fourteen years giving up of his life, what could Jacob have said? <laughs> it's not worth it. You've, you've deceived me. It's not fair. Uh, I'm going back to my father. No, he worked another seven years, a total of 14, because of the love that he had for Rachel. Jacob chose joy over what could have been a very bitter circumstance. Another great example of a biblical character choosing joy is the character of Joseph. What a, what a giant of faith this, this young man must have been. First of all, he was the victim of a murder plot, which thankfully turned into uh, a kidnapping plot and uh, being sale, sold as a slave by his brothers, incidentally. Um, once he found himself in Egypt, he was in a decent situation, but was tempted and falsely accused by his boss's wife, which landed him in jail. But even in the face of that, Jake, Joseph said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So with the choice of giving in or Opposing the advances of Potiphar's wife, uh, the, 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 the choice of opposing ending up, having him ending up in jail, Joseph stayed strong to his beliefs and he ended up in prison. Well, 
God's providence is not shown any more clearly in the life of a person than it is in the, the life of Joseph, who in that circumstance, staying faithful to God, rises, ends up getting out of prison, rises to power, uh, and we know the rest of the story, the great story in the book of Genesis where Joseph begins to be the person to make decisions for the, the kingdom, and he instructs them to save up because there's a famine coming, and when that famine comes in the whole land, who ends up in Egypt asking for food but his brothers? And here again, now, he doesn't immediately reveal himself to them, and he does kind of put him through a little bit of a tough time but I think he wanted to see where their heart was but eventually in a very poignant reunion he reveals himself to not only his brothers but says is my father still alive the answer to which is yes and we know that this whole family is reunited Joseph had a lot to be mad about with his brothers but he ended up saving their lives and bringing them to live with him he chose loyalty to God and the joy of reconciliation and reunion. Thirdly, Ruth. The story of Ruth is one that starts out very sad. You had this couple, Elimelech and Naomi, and they have two sons, Malon and Chilion. Elimelech, the father of the family, dies, and then his sons take two wives. One of them is named Orpah and the other one is Ruth, the namesake of the book. Well, so you have these two men, their wives, Orpah and Ruth, and their mother, Naomi, ten years into the marriages of these brothers, both of them died. Both of the brothers die. So now you have the mother and the two daughter-in-laws, widows, in a day and time when it was very difficult to be a widow when women did not have any standing or power. So you have three women struggling to survive. One of them, Orpah, at Naomi's encouragement, goes back to her family. But Ruth will not. Ruth, having become a part of this family, in Ruth 1.16, one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture with regard to love and family loyalty, Ruth says... Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And if you have time to remind yourself of the the wonderful ending to the story of Ruth. She becomes, in the lineage of King David, great-great-grandmother, if I'm not mistaken, and we know that puts her in the lineage of Jesus Christ himself. Her decision to stay with Naomi because of love and loyalty and faithfulness led her to have a place in the line, the bloodline of Christ. She chose the joy of loyalty as well. And then we come to the New Testament, Paul, who we know as Saul of Tarsus was a, a very smart man, a Pharisee, a zealous persecutor of Christians. Someone whose misdirection in life was made known to him by Jesus himself, and he had to make a choice. Much like Moses chose to give up the glory of Egypt, Paul had to give up his status as a Pharisee and as a, as a, a respected Jew, knowing no doubt that those who were not converted to Christ would be very much against him, which they were, to the point of trying to kill him on numerous occasions. Listen to the words of this man who gave up so much to follow Christ. Philippians 3, verses 4 through 7, Paul says, though I, see, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, 
a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. None of that mattered enough to keep me from doing what I knew was right and being attached to that vine that Jesus himself talked about. Sometimes holding on to the wrong things in life will steal our joy, the joy that we can have in Christ Jesus. Philippians 1 verse 3, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Paul, in the introduction of the book of Philippians. Philippians 1, verse 21. Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul, in this section of Scripture, is saying, As long as I'm alive, my life is going to be about Christ. And when I die, because of that, it is going to be a gain to me. If we can live with that kind of focus on eternity, I believe our lives will be very joyful indeed. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11, we're not going to read the whole section, but Paul says, complete my joy. The same joy that Jesus is talking about. And then finally, Philippians 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord, in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There is comfort in that scripture that we can, through faith, attain a peace which we can't even understand if we are guarded we guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, one thing that I have found is that people who are joyful in Christ focus on a couple of things. They focus on loving and serving others. That's where true joy is to be found through service, not through how much we can gain for ourselves but how much we can serve others and focusing on loving and serving God. We go back to uh, Mac Robinson, the final thought with regard to difficult times in our life. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, James tells us to count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds. And that's, that doesn't compute in our brains because we know that those trials can steal our joy. James says, count it joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And I wonder about Mac Robinson in the 1936 Olympics, breaking the previous Olympic record, but coming in second to Jesse Owens. And I wonder if Jesse hadn't been out there setting the pace, if Mac would have performed at the level he did. We need to understand that the trials, the challenges that force up against us in life, if we rely on God and make it through those things, that builds our faith. James tells that to us here and produces steadfastness. Basically, it makes us spiritually tougher. And we can stay connected to the vine. On just a little bit of a lighter note before we conclude and offer the invitation this morning, I found a, a couple of things on the internet, so they have to be true, about uh, people who found a way to find joy in certain circumstances. And I wanted to share those with you before we conclude. First, we have this man who has a, uh, a skin condition called vitiligo. It, it, the pigment in your skin disappears from certain parts of your body. And what he did was he made these dolls that could be given to children who had the same condition. That's taking a difficult circumstance and finding joy from it. This man had a grandchild who had to have a cochlear implant so that he could hear. 
So he had a tattoo made so he could be like his, his grandson. This guy just decided to set up uh, a telescope so he could have anybody that wanted to walk by and uh, look at the stars. I think, because I can't read that. Yes, okay. <laughs> and boy, these people saved the day. There was a huge power outage, but this one house on the block had power, so they set up a place where people could charge their phones. And this one will really get you. That's a children's hospital where the window washers dress up like heroes. Power Rangers, I think, um, spread a little joy. Our joy, when we look at it and think long term in our life, comes from Christ. That's where it's found. And when we find our lives, again, there are circumstances where this might not be the case when something deeper is going on. But where are we pointing ourselves in life and trying to find joy? Is it in the right place? Are we looking for joy in all the wrong places? Are we trying to stay connected to the vine? Because Jesus' joy was giving up heaven and coming to earth so that we could have the option, the hope, the, 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 the joy that comes through knowing that we have salvation eternally. Perhaps your joy has been stolen somehow this morning. Perhaps you're focusing on the wrong things. Perhaps you had that joy and it's been lost. Maybe you've never experienced it because you haven't connected yourself to that vine that is Jesus and the nutrients of his salvation can flow into our lives if we, if we follow his commands. Whatever your need this morning, there's no better time to make it known and respond as we sing the song selected as we stand.